Hi everyone and welcome to From a Woman to a Leader, a podcast dedicated to discussing women's unique challenges in the tech industry. I'm your host, Limor Bergman Bros, and I'm super excited for this episode, which is the first interview episode of season three. The theme of season three is negotiate like a woman. Negotiate like your true self, authentically and as you are. And I'm super excited to share my first interview with Michelle Merritt. She's a seasoned expert with over 20 years of experience as a Fortune 500 recruiter and a corporate culture executive. And in this episode, we are diving deep into salary negotiations. And you'll learn powerful strategies for negotiating job offers, understanding your value, and getting the compensation you deserve. Michelle shares her top tips and personal stories. So if you want to elevate your negotiation skills, you must listen to this episode. Stay tuned and transform your negotiation skills. And let's dive right in. Hi, Michelle. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. Me too. I am so excited to talk to you because we're going to talk about negotiations. And this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. Mine too. Mine too. Yeah. And you are an expert and uh, we want to help. We want to help women get better at negotiating. So maybe start talking about how you learned to negotiate. Yeah. So, you know, I always say that no one was a, no one's a born negotiator, right? Now my mother might tell you differently about me, but in truth, none of us are born to negotiate. It's, it's nerve wracking and uncomfortable for all of us, right? Where I learned it was from my grandfathers. I was fortunate enough to watch them continually negotiate, right? And so I, I'll never forget the story where my grandfather went car shopping and he had picked out the perfect Cadillac. And he went to the dealer and he said, I'm going to buy this Cadillac today. And the dealer said, great, here's the price. And he said, no, this is what I'm paying for it. And the dealer said, absolutely not. We can't do that. And they went back and forth for a few minutes and he said, this is what I'm paying for this Cadillac. And the dealer said, no, sir, I'm sorry. He said, that's fine. Have a good day. And he left. By the end of the evening, the Cadillac had been parked in his driveway by the dealer. Right? And, and, I, and I remember when he left thinking, but this is the car. This is the one you wanted. Right? I mean, he'd done all this research. And what it taught me from a very young age is to be well prepared to negotiate and never be so attached to something that you're not willing to walk away. Right. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that my other grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was was the king of the banter. Right. He made friends with people, which made people want to help him. And so that made it easier for him to negotiate. And I watched these things growing up, but I wasn't necessarily perfect at it in the beginning and still may not be every time, but um, certainly have learned to do it and teach a lot of people to negotiate today. This is a, an incredible story, Michelle, about your grandfathers. And uh, I, it reminded me that I heard um, that no mm -hmm. is the beginning of the negotiation. Right. Right. You're so right. You're so right. No is the beginning. Right. We take it as an end, but it's not. Now we know where the boundaries are, right? We know where someone wants to be, things like that. And so that we can then um, start a better conversation. Yeah. And you told me earlier that then we talked that uh, initially you weren't that, you know, polished in negotiating. And that kind of led you to um, even, you know, uh, fail or not not get what you wanted can you share a little bit about that yeah so in my first first professional position 
I did not know that you could negotiate at work, right? I'd watched my grandfathers all of that, but I had not been with them in their professional work settings. So I didn't know you could negotiate your salary. And so later on, I learned that I left about $10,000 in annual salary on the table, right? I took an offer that was about 10,000 less than what they would have paid me if I had asked for it. What does that translate to today? Well, if you do the math over the lifetime of a career, if I had taken that $10,000 and every year just invested that $10,000 into my 401k, it averages out to about $1.4 million over the lifetime of my career, right? That's mind boggling. That's what most people shoot it for in their retirement account, right? This is, yeah, this is mind blowing. Right. And so even as young women, and we see more young women today willing to negotiate than when in my Gen X generation, when we were first coming up. But it is true that we want the opportunity to negotiate today. And so in doing so, we ensure financial success. Because think about it, your next opportunity, your next raise is a percentage of your current salary, more more, more than likely. So we want to make sure that you're getting as much in that base salary as possible and asking for what you've candidly earned. Yes, and uh, I can share that managing people for so long, when you start, when your base start low, it's really difficult for a manager to compensate that later on because companies usually they have like uh, the rates where mm-hmm. they increase salaries. So they have like a band between, okay, 3%, it's the average, maybe 5% is, you know, good and 10% is great. Mm-hmm. So there's a limit to how much you can fix it later right. without needing to leave right. and go to another job. Right. And if you do leave here in the States, there are about 22 states or municipalities now that cannot ask your current salary. Right. We're made slowly but surely it's becoming illegal throughout the U.S. to ask what your current salary is. There's a great website called HR Dive and you can search HR Dive and it will give you the list of um, states and municipalities that have outlawed asking about your current salary for this reason, because we want people to um be rewarded for the position when they go to a new company based on what the position pays, not based on what they were making before. Yeah, and this is a very important information, Michelle. Thank you so much for sharing. I will look at that website later and I'll put it in the show notes. Definitely know that it may be illegal. And even if it is legal, you don't have to share, you know. So let's talk about strategies because you worked as a recruiter and you told me that you negotiated all the time for behalf of your clients. So let's talk about your experience helping clients. So the best thing I was taught as a recruiter is to understand your automatic yes and your automatic no, right? So what does that look like? The automatic yes is, while we wouldn't advise it, you could accept an offer at face value right? You wouldn't have to negotiate. You wouldn't have to check in with loved ones or significant others at home. You could just automatically say yes, if it met this threshold. And that threshold varies for each person. Um, The automatic no is it doesn't matter how much I like you. It doesn't matter how excited I am about the position. If it's below this threshold, it can't happen, right? And so What makes up those automatic yeses and automatic noes? That's the thing we have to get to, right? For many people, it's salary. But for a lot of people, it's more than salary. It's bonus potential. It's how the bonus is determined. It's one thing to say, oh, Michelle, you have a 50% bonus opportunity here. But if the KPIs or the goals are set in such a way that they're insurmountable, it's not really a 50% bonus opportunity. So knowing how the bonus is determined And who decides it? Is it subjective? Is it objective? Are there specific goals you have to meet for part of it? And is it just a matter of whether or not your boss likes you for the other part, right? Um, It's vacation. It's flexibility. We, especially among women, and now more so with men too, we're seeing a desire for flexibility, whether that's going into the office, whether that's the time worked, whether it's time in and away from the office, things like that, because we're so connected today that most of us 
are working even when we're not working. So having that flexibility to go to the, you know, your child's wrestling meet at four o'clock, but still take a call if necessary is more becoming more and more important as we seek balance. So then it's things like retirement planning, insurance benefits. What are the, what's the cost of your insurance benefits? I had a client a couple of years ago who was offered her dream job and she was so excited, but the one thing she didn't check into was the cost of her insur- her new insurance versus her old insurance. The new insurance was about the same price, but the deductibles were much higher and they were a family with young children. So they used their insurance regularly. That promotion in air quotes became about a $10,000 loss at the end of the first year because they hadn't quite done the math. So it's starting to really understand all of those pieces and then negotiating and identifying what's important in those. Yeah, and uh, you raise a very, very valid point, Michelle. It's about, first of all, understanding that uh, when you negotiate, it's not just about the base salary. There are so many other components. Some companies offer sign-up bonuses. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they may have regular annual bonuses. Mm -hmm. And companies, some company offer equity. And some companies offer, as you said, like all the companies usually offer health insurance, but it varies. It can vary dramatically. And 401k also can vary. How much Mm -hmm. the company is contributing to your 401k. Mm -hmm. If it's 3% or 6%, it cha- you know, that, that number can change the larger your base salary becomes. The other thing I'll say is be mindful of those sign-on bonuses, right? We see a lot of people get very excited about sign-on bonuses. Here in the United States, they are taxed at a very high rate, a much higher rate typically than your base salary is taxed. So if you can get all or some of that sign-on bonus into your base salary instead, Number one, it distributes it out throughout the year, so the tax is less on it. But also then that adds to that raise for the next year because, again, those percentages are being calculated that way. Absolutely. And also you, when your base is higher, you get higher for uh, 401k deduct- right. deduct- deduction. So. Absolutely. Definitely. I mean, but I know, I know that sometimes employers are limited, at least based on my experience as hiring people, Sometimes companies have limitations around how much they can stretch the base salary versus mm-hmm. they can give in a sign-on bonus. So that's sometimes a lever that right. you can use. You don't have to, but uh, it's right. an option. Absolutely. So I want to ask you, Michelle, let's say I, uh, you know, I want a job. I interviewed. I pass all the steps. They want me. I want them. How do I start the whole negotiation process? Right. So hopefully you're working with a recruiter or someone in talent acquisition if it's a larger company. But, you know, one of the first things I do is ask if this is the final offer or if there's room for discussion or room for negotiation in the offer. I never I never say yes or no. Right from the beginning. Right. I, I ask for time to look at it. One of the things I do is ask what their deadline is. Right. Instead of saying, I'm going to review this and get you get it to you tomorrow. I say, I want to take some time to review this. When do you need an answer? Because more than likely, the company will give you more time than you'll give yourself. Right? So that gives you a little more time to review it, to do your research, things like that. So then it is a matter of, again, starting to know those priorities. And in addition to knowing your priorities, hopefully you've done your research on what is the average compensation for this position in your industry, in your, in your part of the country, in your part of the world, et cetera? So then you can start to identify, okay, this is my priority and this meets my priority, but this item here does not. How important is that to me? Things like that. And so then you can start to negotiate that by identifying, first of all, what is their priority? And then putting, making sure everything is in writing. You're not reviewing an offer until you have the offer in writing, and then you're responding in writing to the individual so that you can say, you know, I'm really excited about this, and it will be easy for me to say yes if. Yeah, I love it. 
And I, uh, usually, you know, um, at least uh, based uh, on what I recall when I was uh, interviewed and, and the company made offers to me, they send, uh, they do send in writing, but usually they include just the base salary, whether there's a sign-on bonus and equity. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes maybe 401k, but a lot of times they don't have all the details, right? Like you mentioned, the health insurance information. They say, oh, the health insurance after you, you join, you know, mm -hmm. we will discuss with you exactly how to roll on to health insurance and 401k and all that. So what do you suggest? You know where to so do. I always ask to see their copy of their insurance plan, right? So, for so example, in the United States, there may be specific doctors you can use in specific healthcare plans, right? I may want to see that list of providers so that I can determine are my medical providers in that list, or am I going to be paying more because I am an out of service, out of pocket provider? Then I'm working with an out-of-pocket provider, something like that. So that's the first thing. I'm going to there's that's a red flag for me if they're refusing to share their health insurance benefits when they're writing an offer. Right? 401k, same thing. I want to know what their contribution is, what their max contribution is, what and then compare that to what I have as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that that's very common and should be okay to ask, hey, can you share also your health insurance benefits, your 401k benefits, and pretty much any benefit, right? I mean, anything else. Absolutely. Anything else that's included. Bonuses. Um, be careful with vacation, right? Sometimes people will say, oh, we have unlimited vacation. That started happening five or 10 years ago now, where people would say, oh yeah, we just take off the time you need. Well, who's ever felt like they have enough, they're, they're caught up enough to take vacation, right? So what we find is that in a company where unlimited vacation is an option, they're using an average of about three days less a year than people who have set vacations, right? So if I'm offered unlimited vacation, and that might be their policy, they're not going to change that for one person, but I do want to know what do, how much time does the average person take off in this role? In, at this tier, in this department, things like that. So I get a feel for, is this department only taking a week off a year and I'm used to taking four weeks? Or is it, and is it going to be frowned upon if I take off more time? Things like that, because that can make up a big difference in how we work. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. To be honest, I mean, uh, the last two companies I worked at had this unlimited, it's not unlimited, like fe flexible time of whatever they call it. And um, they were pretty good actually with it. I, I was able to take about five weeks off a year. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, I mean, uh, first of all, it's a company policy. There is not much you can do about it. And also a lot of times it really depends on your manager. And the group you're at, and not necessarily maybe HR will tell you or the company recruiter, hey, yes, you can take as much as you need, and people take may take up to four or five weeks off a year, and then you reach out to a manager that maybe they don't like to take time off, the, and they don't like their people to take time off. So how do you right. know that? Right. Or is this manager someone who says, yeah, you can take, you can be out of the office, but you need to be available by phone while you're gone. Or you need to be on an email while you're gone. Well, if you're getting 100 emails a day from your manager while you're on vacation with your family, that's not a vacation. And your family's not getting your attention. So that may be okay for you. It may not be. But know that going into that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, thing out there is the, um, the commute time, right? So many of us have gone to working remotely today. Factor in when you're considering a new opportunity, what your commute will look like. We had a client who was getting a significant pay bump because she was going from academia to a for-profit Fortune 100 organization. But the commute was 45 minutes each way. And it was a sizable commute. It was not... It was several miles because it was in the Midwest where things are spread a little farther apart, right? And so she was driving 30 to 40 miles each way every day. So we started calculating what is the cost of gas? 
What is the cost of the time that she was investing in the drive where before it was a 10 minute drive? Things like that. Um, what is the wear and tear on your vehicle driving 80 miles round trip every single day? How, how that means you've changed tires more frequently. That means you likely have to buy a new car sooner than you might have planned. Things like that based on mileage. So we start to factor in those things too and be mindful of the commute. Some people really love the commute. That is their time to get ready for the day and that is their time to decompress after the day where other people it's very taxing on them to be in traffic for 40 minutes at a time. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of my job, I had to uh, commute uh, 50 miles uh, each direction. So 100 miles a day and uh, it was uh, not for me for sure. Uh, after <laughs> two and a half years, I left because I, I, like, I couldn't do it anymore. But some people like it. I mean... Uh, yeah. I'd... Right. And just know what, again, know your priorities, right? That's a, that's a factor. And today we might say, you know, I'm willing to do that two or three days a week, but I'm not willing to do that five days a week. So is there an option to work remotely or have a hybrid schedule, something like that? If that is the answer to the commute issue for you, great, but know that ahead of time and be prepared to have that conversation. Definitely. So how would I negotiate to get the best maximum outcome that I want? Let's say I want, right? I want more higher salary and, um, you know, how do I, how do right. I do that? So by knowing your priorities, right, we're, we're asking for the things that are most important first. So, um, you know, again, I'm putting in writing. Thank you for the offer. I'm excited about this opportunity because I'm letting them know I want to say yes right? It will be easier for me to say yes, if, and then I may say the salary goes from 100,000 to, you know, the salary is bumped up to 125,000, something like that. If that's your number, I'm making numbers up, um, you know, and the, the um, bonus opportunity is raised to X amount, something like that, or the time off is increased to three weeks in the first year instead of just one something like that. Um, so you know your numbers, you know what you're asking for, and you're very clear. But you also want to speak to how, why you, why it's going to be a benefit to them. Right? I'll never forget, I had a client once who reached out to me. And she said, I want X amount of dollars. And it was a $150,000 pay increase. And I said, great. She said, I need you to teach me how to get it. Great. What have you done to earn the right to ask for that amount of money? Well, I haven't. I just want it. Well, we can want everything. I can want to be the Pope, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen for me, right? So we want to make sure that we can articulate and describe what it is we've done to earn that right to ask and what we bring to the employer, why it is beneficial to them to increase that. So after I'm laying out the things that I need, I'm saying, you know, I am confident that my skills X, Y, and Z will increase the value, you know, will increase X company's value over the course of my first year. And I look forward to, you know, can, can starting with the company, something like that. And so we want to make sure we're showing them their ROI, their return on investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you mentioned writing. So, so you think it's better based on your, your experience, you recommend to negotiate in writing rather than, Hey, let's have another call. I do. I do. You can certainly have the conversation, but everything still needs to be in writing. Right, because the only thing that we're required to commit to are the things we've agreed to in writing. Mm -hmm. So, make sure that whatever you agree to is put in writing in a formal offer, because that's what they're required to. That's the required commitment on both parts. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, eventually, if I uh, negotiate and uh, they they uh, increase the salary, they will send me the contract, but. Yeah. The question mm -hmm. is if the negotiation, like the negotiation itself, that may be a back and forth, mm -hmm. is it better to do it in writing or I just ask for it? Writing. 
I think that you can be more concise. We tend to get nervous when we're speaking to other people, right? So we'll trip on our words. We might articulate something differently than we would in writing. They might be able to detect our nervousness, things like that. Or if it's in writing, we don't lose that upper hand. For sure. Now they may pick up the phone and call and say, hey, let's talk about this. And you need to be prepared to have that conversation. Yeah. I have another question. What mm-hmm. would I do if I want, I want to maximize everything, but the market is not that great. I don't have many options. And uh, I'm afraid that if I uh, aim too high, they may not want to hire me. Mm-hmm. That can be scary. And so you have to know your, that's, that's part of knowing your automatic yes, right? How much risk, and everyone has a different sense of their risk aversion, right? So how risk averse are you, right? Can you walk away like my grandfather did with the Cadillac, right? Thinking, oh, they'll probably be back, but if they're not, it's okay. I'll find there'll be another car out there, right? Or is it a matter of, listen, I've been out of work for six months and my family needs a paycheck. I need a paycheck. So I can't risk too much. I can ask for this, but I also have to recognize that I'm willing to still accept it if it's here. In all my years of doing this, I've only had one client where when they've negotiated, the the company pulled the offer just because they negotiated. For the record, that company two months later filed for bankruptcy. Mm, okay. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to ask for more. You can certainly accept an offer at face value. No one's saying you have to negotiate, but there are lots of opportunities to ask for more and do it respectfully. Again, you know, excited about the offer. Easy. It will be easier for me to say yes if. Yeah. Right? So come at, approach it in a positive way, not Absolutely. demanding. Not saying right. I will only take the offer if you raise in mm-hmm. X, Y, Z, but right. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to start working with you and it will help me say mm-hmm. yes if uh, you could uh, give me additional. Absolutely. Whatever. Right. Whatever your priorities are. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And uh, based on my experience, sometimes it's um, it's a discussion about a... Uh, uh, you may ask for more salary and they will say, I cannot give you more salary, mm-hmm. but I can give you more equity or right. I can give you a sign-on bonus or I can give you something else. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if you're talking about equity and you're going to a startup organization, for example, um, think about the divest- find out what is in their divestiture clause. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you're offered 2%, right, vested over the course of five years, the, there should be a clause there that says if the company is sold within three years instead of five, the five and you're not fully vested because it's not been the five years, then you gain, you gain full vesting privileges as soon as the company is sold. Something like that. So be a, pay attention to that divestiture clause in the event that you are talking about equity in an organization that might be up for sale. Yeah, for sure. And they'll say, and oftentimes, you know, rightfully so, they'll tell you, listen, we don't anticipate selling. And they may not be anticipating selling. But a lot can happen in four years. Look, look back to where we were in 2020, right? So much has happened in the last four years. Someone may approach them about purchasing their organization. And if you don't have that divestiture clause that allows you to be fully vested, you're going to leave money on the table. For sure. I, I, I mean, from my experience, the whole um, equity is uh, complicated, especially in startup when it's not RSUs, yeah. when it's uh, stock options. It's complicated. And yeah. uh, a lot of times the recruiter will not know much. I mean, uh, yes, if it's in writing, great, but uh, it, it's complicated. And uh, sometimes really someone like the CFO or some, someone from finance need to be involved to explain the full Absolutely. kind of terms. Um, just and in cases like that, it's smart to have an employment attorney, right? 
a coach like me can walk you through a lot of it, but we are not licensed attorneys, right? So um, think about hiring an employment attorney to go through the fine print when you're talking about complicated things like that. Same thing with severance agreements. And that severance agreements become more common the further up you go in your career, right? But we want to make sure that if you leave, you, if, if you're asked to leave the company, if there is a change that occurs, something like that, that you're protected for a certain amount of time, whether that is six months, whether that's a year, so that you have time to make your change. Because executive changes, career changes can take six to 12 months often to complete. That's a very, very important point. Yes, um, severance packages, uh, from my experience, typically companies are willing to give you more because they want a peace of mind that there will not be any lawsuit. They don't want to mess with anything. They prefer that you will sign it and you will get money. So typically you have some leverage there because Absolutely. they want to just a clean cut. Right, right. Yeah. Definitely. Wow, it's been incredible. What else have we missed, Michelle? Anything that you feel like we haven't touched on and you would want to share? One thing I'll mention is in the interview process. At the beginning of the phase, the beginning of the conversations around the interview, oftentimes a recruiter, whether that's external recruiters or a talent acquisition person internally, will say, where do you need to be? Right? I always caution people not to give a range. Right. If we go back to our hundred thousand dollar number, right? So I, instead of saying I need to be between a hundred and one twenty five, because when we say that, what we're saying is we'll take the offer for a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Instead, if we say I need total compensation of X, that might be one fifty total by the time we're factoring in. Um, bonus potential, things like that, right? I need to be total compensation of X dollars. If that's 150, great. I'm open to how that's made up. And we can talk about that. Or what I'll often ask people to do is when asked for what your salary requirements are, instead of answering that question, I will answer with a question by saying, can you tell me what the range is? And I'll be truthful with you as to whether or not I can make that work. That's a great right, so, strategy. You know, instead of saying my range is between 100 and 125, perhaps, you know, the recruiter says, well, we're at 120 to 130 for this position. My response is going to be great. I can make that work. Know that I'm going to be on the top end of that salary range. Yes. And uh, I, I don't know, Michelle, mm-hmm. I don't know how many... Recruiters will want to share that range. Maybe, I don't know. But they know that they ask for it because they don't want to waste time interviewing someone that eventually, after the whole interviewing process, will ask a salary that they cannot give. Right. And no recruiter wants that because they're being paid by the employer when the deal is closed, right? So we all want this to come to fruition. So... The more you can be transparent while still protecting yourself, the better. So asking them for their range and then being truthful. And, you know, listen, if you, if they say 120 to 130 and your minimum salary requirement is 140, then you can say, you know, I'm a little bit above that. Is there room there? Is there flexibility in that number? Oh, God. And yeah. then they may say, well, where do you need to be? Well, I need to be at 140. Yeah, and I think that the total compensation uh, strategy is great because uh, it uh, also gives you a lot of flexibility. So you're not locking in yourself to a specific number and you're saying, hey, I'm open to discuss how that's going to be divided. So that's always good because it opens the negotiation and not close it. Right. And remember, that bonus number, you need to understand how it's paid. Right. Because again, I can tell you there's a hundred percent bonus, but if that is based on whether or not my boss likes me, I may not be getting that hundred thousand dollars at the end of the year. Yeah, from my experience, typically they say something like it depends on the company performance and this is kind of vague because like, well, I I cannot control that and uh, it's basically not making any promises to you. So what I ask for when that happens 
is the five-year average bonus payout for the company. So has the company met its goals for the last five years? As well as what has the prior person in this position achieved? Have they received their full bonus over the last five years or other people in this tier, right? Sometimes it's the whole tier gets a certain bonus, right? So what has been the average bonus payout for the last five years? If your bonus potential is 50% and the average bonus payout has been 20% over the last five years, then I'm only banking on 20%. Right. And I go five years back because that's pre COVID and pre pandemic, life was much different. And the pandemic hit every single company, right? In some way, some for the better, some for the worse. But we want to find the outliers there and find our average over the last five years. Definitely. Well, this has been incredible, Michelle. Thank you so much for, you for, having me. for sharing so many tips. And now, before we leave, I want to ask you, how can people find you? Yes. So you can find us on our website, dscareermanagement.com. Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I have a very active LinkedIn presence. Um, it's just LinkedIn slash IN slash Michelle Merritt. So um, those are the easiest ways to find me. I'm I'm on LinkedIn regularly. Um, and again, our website's really active too. So um, you can find me either way. Perfect. And I will put both your website and uh, your LinkedIn URL on the show notes. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being here today. It was great to see you. Thank you so much for listening for another episode of From a Woman to a Leader. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Michelle Merritt and all the tips she gave about negotiating your job offers. What's coming up next week? Next week, I have a special guest. I'm sitting down with Samantha Kuzuk, and she is the founder of the Manuscript Journal. And she's a motivational speaker, and we're going to talk on a different angle of negotiations. We're going to talk about why self-worth is so crucial for successful negotiation. And Samantha will share practical steps to overcome self-doubt, step out of your comfort zone, and navigate societal stereotype. If you're ready to take your negotiation skills to the next level and build the confidence that you need to succeed, please subscribe to the podcast. You never want to miss another episode. And uh, we're going to dive deep into negotiations. And I'm so excited. Stay tuned and I'll see you next week.